Alright, just gonna mess around on Forza for tonight, because I can't be bothered doing anything else. It's one of those days. Right then, where were we? Um, have a little goosey gander. do the drift ones as well but drifting isn't my thing but we've got to try that's for sure It is safe to do so. You have arrived at your destination. What is this then? I haven't really had a look at this one. Great to see you. We're shooting a documentary about car culture in the UK and I need a second driver. You've made a name for yourself and it would be great to have you aboard. I need more coffee. It's simple. You drive, I tell the story. Let's do it. Okie job. From Aston Martin to McLaren Whoa, and Bentley, Great Britain is home to over a century of automotive excellence. I'm Rebecca Dawson. Welcome to British Racing Green, a documentary celebrating that history. The Aston Martin DB5 Vantage was the quintessential grand tourer of the 1960s combining British engineering and Italian design. featured side draft carburettors and a refined camshaft profile capable of a blistering top speed of 162 miles an hour in 1964. The clean lines of Superleggera's bodywork, reclining seats and wool carpets created a car that was luxurious as well as fast. for the DB range, with later cars improving the design in many ways, the least. but none would it's ever fun, for sure. the sheer iconic perfection of the Vantage. In 200 yards, turn left, turn left. 
for all of its beauty and engineering perfection, only 65 of these beautiful machines would ever be built. If you own one, you own a piece of British history. In 200 yards, you will arrive at your destination. The silver DB5 would be immortalized in half <sighs> a century of cinema. The classic Aston Martin. But in 2016, a new DB was unveiled, heralding the dawn of Aston Martin's second century. The DB11 is the first production turbocharged Aston Martin. But is it a worthy successor to that legacy? I want to find out. The short answer is yes. It's bold, responsive, and agile. 100. With perhaps the best GT chassis in the world. world. And listen to it. Reset the counter. Able to hit 60 miles an hour in 3.5 seconds, the DB11's 5.2-litre twin-turbo V12 boasts a top speed of over 200 miles an hour. DB11 is not the fastest car in the world, but then it's not trying to be. It's sophisticated, effortless luxury. It's an Aston Martin. DB11's front strakes channel mm -hmm. air to create a virtual spoiler, providing downforce without compromising the car's clean lines. Brilliant. If you're gonna come down a hundred, you've got to get back up really quite quick. Most importantly, I think, the DB11 proves that Aston Martin is ready for another century of beautiful cars. And I can't wait. Beautiful as they are, Aston Martins are only one of many cars. Hello, Gareth, how are you doing? Let's see what else is out there. Nailed it. I think I prefer the original, it was more fun. At least in this game it is anyway. Yeah, wrong one. Here comes a spin. Ah, oh, it's been one of those days. Endless running around and getting nowhere fast. Nice just uh, put a game on and relax, I think. Great. I got some shorts. That's what I wanted. Let's continue. I don't know why they just don't have an option to continue whilst you're in that chapter rather than coming out and going back in. This is shaping up nicely. Time for a change of pace, though. At okay. least at first. The next segment is about Land Rover, and we'll be starting out with the Type 3. That play.
Land Rover, the British sports utility vehicle. But before that, they were actual utility vehicles. Solid, tough trucks, unstoppable tough over trucks. almost any terrain. In 400 yards, oh, I get the feeling I should be driving Turner. straight line across. The Land Rover Type 3 marks the point where that shift begins. And we'll be looking at what that meant. Land Rovers have taken on almost every task imaginable. They've been generators, tractors and ambulances. They've brought peace and carried medicines to disaster zones. They've even been buses. Over bus. half a million Series 3s were built, and over 70% of those are still on the road today. They were extensively them, exported and built under license abroad. Belgium, South Africa, even Australia and New Zealand. With a robust chassis and signature Land Rover engineering, the Type 3 also marked the first time that buyers could choose interior options, like seat box protectors and cubby boxes. That trend continued. And by 1982, Land Rover were offering the county spec Type 3. Leisure drivers could choose from such luxuries as all cloth seats, soundproofing, and tinted glass. The trend was increasingly clear, and the future of the Land Rover was starting to take shape. If you squinted, you could already see the shape of the first sports utility vehicle, the Range Rover. While the stock Type 3 would never be particularly fast uphill, well, there is go, almost is no hill that it couldn't climb. Or down, for that matter, if you put a proper winch on it. In 1978, a Series 3 was custom-built for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It only had 1,892 miles on the clock when it was auctioned into private hands. And it was in perfect condition. It would be. After all, she trained as a mechanic in the 1940s and will likely remain the only royal able to strip and rebuild an engine. I'm sure that's what she did on her spare time. In 200 yards, you will arrive at your destination. Along with the Range Rover, others would follow. <coughs> Discovery, Defender, and the Freelander. Each a more sophisticated and enjoyable utility vehicle. But none of them were a replacement for the Type 3. They were a different kind of car. To give us now. The Type okay. 3 was arguably the first sports utility vehicle, an evolution of the design that would lead ultimately to this. The Bowler Nemesis, an off-road racing vehicle that turned into a production SUV, the Nemesis EXR. It sports a turbocharged 5-litre <laughs> Land Rover Jaguar target. engine ah, crammed into targets. a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. 25,000 skill points, is it? It even has the grille, headlights and rear lights from a Range Rover. Why do I get the feeling I'm probably just better off just driving off a cliff? Ah, that'll be the edge of one. That didn't work, did it? Ah. 
Yeah, this has got to go well because I need the worst straight off the edge of that. It's a great sound, but I know nothing about the track around here. got to be done or I can't progress. What happened to all the points I had before? I thought they were racking up like 10,000 then it vanished. It sports a turbocharged 5 litre Land Rover Jaguar engine crammed into a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grill, headlights and rear lights from a Range Rover. I'm sure there's a jump I should be hitting, but I can't see it. I have no idea what I'm supposed to be doing around here to get really high skills. It just drifts, jumps, banging, crashing, you know. You get wrecked. And let's try another take. Yeah, what do you do around there? What's the best thing? Is it supposed to be drifting? Is it just trying to hit the jumps? Is there some it sports kind of a jump? It's a turbocharged five litre Land Rover Jaguar engine crammed into a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grille, headlights, and rear lights from a Range Rover.
So if you don't get a straight line, you can't use that. Take a breather and let's try again with so, less excitement. Let's try and hit the top of that and then go down it. It sports a turbocharged 5 litre Land Rover Jaguar engine crammed into a carbon top. fiber chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grille, headlights, and rear lights from a Range Rover. Still again. Ow. It's not bad, but could we make it a little more majestic? <sighs> I really don't like these skill things. And I should have pressed them. It sports a turbocharged 5 litre Land Rover Jaguar engine, crammed into a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. It even has the grille, headlights, and rear lights from a Range Rover. Uh, no, didn't break. Do it in a straight line. Take a moment, then let's do that bit again. <laughs> well, I've got close by what a thousand points once upon a time, but I have no idea what I'm doing. 
It sports a turbocharged 5-litre Land Rover Jaguar engine crammed into a carbon fibre chassis with integral roll cage. It even Ow. has the grille, headlights and rear lights from a Range Rover. Is an all-terrain supercar. That's the only that was hard for me. For this. But God, that's me that car. you build an SUV with Land Rover suck at that DNA. One.
Sorry about that, I had to go and sort some stuff rather urgently. All back now though. See if we get anything else to do, shall we? Hope there don't give me another flipping off road. I hate off road crap. Hope you're enjoying yourself. I know I am. No, the last it's one. It's great shit. to be able to just focus on telling the story while someone else handles the driving for once. Let's get to the next one. This time it's Lotus. Looks like it's going to be a bit of a, a slide fest in this one. Lotus Engineering Limited began as many stories in British engineering Ooh. do <laughs> in an old farm. The first Lotus yeah. cars were offered as kits. You built them yourself. In 400 yards, turn left. From 1962, they began to actually build the cars themselves. The Elan Sprint showed exactly what they intended to do. Built around a steel backbone with a fiberglass chassis, the Sprint weighed in at a meagre 687 kilos parked on the curb. On the road, this translated into brilliant agility and fantastic performance. There's a little bit more up. This will be fun. Uh -oh, trouble. Hello. Mr. Mini. Designer Colin Chapman famously said, adding power makes you faster on the straights. Subtracting weight makes you faster everywhere. He knew what he was talking about. In 100 yards, turn right. In 100 yards, turn left. Widely hailed as one of the greatest sports cars of the 1960s, the Elan would be closely studied and emulated, inspiring such masterpieces as the Mazda MX-5. The Elan has all the energy, style and enthusiasm you would expect. Bold, quick and fun. So much so that they put it in the name. Ooh, I messed that up. What a shame. Right, give me something sporty. <sighs> the Elan Sprint was a financial as well as an engineering success for Lotus, validating their approach to design and resulting in a whole family of light, agile roadsters. Which brings us to this, the Lotus Exige. It's heavier than the Elan, admittedly, but it's faster, much, much faster. I wonder what that is. Touch the pedal, the Exige responds with instant, relentless acceleration, as you'd expect. Yep, with a 0-60 time of 3.8 seconds and a top speed of 170 before upgrades and tuning, the Exige is uncompromising. Let's go back to panels, shall we? And there's no power steering, so you can really feel the road. A genuinely thrilling drive, and one that isn't afraid to demand you take it seriously. In 400 yards, turn left. Turn left. In one word, Lotus is about the experience. Uncompromising, challenging. This is a car that demands you drive it well. And when you do, you'll see what the fuss is all about.
200 yards, you will arrive at your destination. And with rumored launches of two new cars in 2020, Lotus looks set to push the benchmark of the experienced sports car well into the next century. That looks like it needs a bit of practice. now done much rallying that's a joke we've all seen what you've been up to we're doing the next bit on location Not a lot. you'll see why when you get there Whatever. In four hundred yards, you will arrive at your destination. way just to smack into a tree. Lovely. Ooh, hello. Ford, that most American of cars. But the Ford Escort, oh, that's British. And more than that, the Escort would become for many synonymous with Group B. In the 70s, Ford had embraced that destiny so firmly that they'd begun their own championships to find new drivers. Drivers for cars like the RS1800, This was a car designed explicitly for rallying, with a powerful fuel-injected 1790cc Cosworth BDE engine. Oh. The end likes to come in, that's for sure. Well. Rules required that all cars entered into the group be production. Can you, can you so Ford that? built two hundred oh Okay. Sensibly now. The RS eighteen hundred raced to victory after victory across the rallying world, on almost every continent, and across every terrain type imaginable. This car was basically unbeatable. The RS1800 brought home 17 <sighs> World Rally Championship victories for Ford. You wonder how. So, of course, Ford set out to design a better one. The RS200 Evolution was their answer, 
A purpose-built rally car designed to do one thing, win Group B. With a 1.8 turbocharged Ford Cosworth BDT engine and all-wheel drive, the RS200 had perhaps the best suspension platform of any car of its era. The chassis was fiberglass from Reliant, and the massive Ford parts bin was raided to give the car that iconic look. But while the car had potential, turbo lag at low RPM and a poor power-to-weight ratio meant that it never placed better than third. Ooh, ooh. The end of Group B in the mid-80s meant the end of the RS200 as a rallying car. Fortunately, Ford built over 200 as part of the homologation requirements for Group B, so you can still find them, if you're lucky. If you're lucky. Definitely better than the other one. Ness. No. Should I get rid of these poxy things? You know, I really like this car. You drive Not that it, I'd want to drive it for too long. Squeeze yourself in there and let's see just how fast you can make it go. Which won't be too fast. But hey, I could be surprised. Gonna be all over the shop. The Peel P50 has the dubious honor of being the smallest production car in the world. A one door oh, micro car coupe. Featuring a 42cc road. capable of a heinous 38 miles an hour. And a handle, so you can pick it up and carry it with you when you get to work. And keep in mind that this is the production version. <laughs> the prototype had the single wheel at the front. Why would you think that was a good idea? The weaver comes... Oh! Heal the power. Uh, I know you want more time in that car. <laughs> you got a speed limit and I didn't today. check. Oh, great. Seven miles an hour too slow. <laughs> that was rubbish. The Peel P50 has the dubious honor of being the smallest production car in the world. A one-door microcar coupe featuring a 42cc air-cooled engine capable of a heinous 38 miles an hour. Right, we're there. And a handle so you can pick it up and carry it with you when you get to work. And keep in mind that this is the production version. The prototype had the single wheel at the front. Why would you think that was a good idea? Fucking in his jet. Come on! In oh, 2010, God, though, production restarted at Sutton in Ashfield. So, if you'd like to own the modern incarnation of this, I suppose you can. I can help it. Yeah, whatever. I don't believe that's it. Let's get one card to do in that one. That's hopeless. Spiffing.
Hey there. How about a car with some actual legroom and some actual speed? This section's speed. about what happened when McLaren decided to make a road car. You're going to enjoy this. The track and the road have very different requirements. For McLaren, that was a challenge they were more than willing to embrace. In 1988, they set out to create the finest sports car the world has ever this seen. This feels a little twitchy. By 1993, they had achieved their goal, and the honestly fantastic F1 was the result. 106 would be built across all variants, and it remains one of the very best road cars ever made. The F1 has no turbocharger. That would have compromised the driving experience, increased complexity, and resulted in turbo lag. The F1 is a naturally aspirated supercar, one of the fastest in the world, in fact. Everything about this car is innovative, from the carbon fiber monocoque to the central driver position. McLaren threw the book away when they designed the F1. Then they wrote a better one. The F1's oh, monocoque chassis down. is incredibly lightweight, only 100 kilos all told, which posed a significant challenge because carbon fiber and fiberglass aren't great insulators. So McLaren lined the entire engine compartment with gold. In 1998, the F1 prototype set the world record for fastest production car, a record that would stand for two decades until the Koenigsegg CCR claimed the crown. McLaren's racing heritage is so deeply ingrained in this machine that they took it to Le Mans in 1995 and faced off against purpose-built racing machines and won. So, with something like the F1 to live up to, where do you go next? Well, you throw the book away again and write an even better one. The result is the McLaren P1, a hybrid electric sports car that stands head and shoulders above the F1. The P1 GTR will hit 60 miles an hour in 2.4 seconds. That's 0.7 seconds faster than the F1. That's an eternity for a supercar. The car's blistering performance is delivered by a twin-turbo V8, supplemented by a McLaren ECU electric motor and instant power assist system. And they do mean instant. Oh, yeah, that's a bit. Those rears do light up quick. I don't much time to play with these, though, do they? Turbo lag. The yeah, like a couple of corners that and that's it. The hybrid what was the fun of that? While the turbos build pressure, the electric motor drives the wheels. No turbo lag, just torque. And because it's a hybrid, it has an all-electric range. Running on batteries alone, that's 6.2 miles. A bit more if you're going downhill. Hmm. Just enough to get to the shops. Next chapter. I quite like sleeper cars. Did Alex ever tell you the story of what we got up to in Colorado? There was this sleeper car competition, you see. Let's just say no one was ready for the sunbeam. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. 
Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Oh. No, I lost that ages ago. capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third Brakes exit. Well. The tires were widened, and the tire compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade handful. they didn't yeah. put in was the electronic their own speed Jesus. limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. A 177 miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four-door saloon. We'll reset and take that section again. Yeah, we're going to have to, aren't we? Wow. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The, the tyres were widened, and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. Uh, a 177 mile supercar, masquerading as a four door saloon. It's a tough one. You're right, not to worry. Reset and let's try another take. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So, in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tyres were widened, and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. Do we have to be crossed there for? The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. 
All of this uh -oh. resulted in the Lotus <laughs> Halt. Designated Type 104 by Lotus. Jesus. A 177 miles per hour <sighs> masquerading as a four-door saloon. That was spectacular. Take a breather and let's try again with less excitement. Lotus never it. quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 liters, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. Oh. The roundabout, take the third exit. The tires were widened, and the tire compound That's from the Lotus Spree was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only upgrade really they did of that. was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton, designated one Type 104 pra by Lotus. Practice, 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 and all a of a sudden, we're bling, and you get it. A miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four-door saloon. That was not bad, but could we make it a little more majestic? No. Lotus never all quite let go of the nothing. upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, that. there are a few signs that this is something special. Why do we like this, that sort of thing? But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tires were widened, and the tire compound Seriously? from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. Upgrade they did with the traffic was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton. Look at the power down, that's the problem. By Lotus. A 177 miles per hour supercar, masquerading as a four door saloon. Are you alright? Take a moment, then let's do that bit again. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. Oh, shit. But under the bonnet, <laughs> that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 liters, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were it added. Starts the, slide. the engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. Oh, right. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tires were widened, and the tire compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. The only
only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Still need to be quicker. Carlton, designated Type 104 by Lotus. Blimey. A 177 miles per hour oh, I wish you could shut her up. Masquerading as a four-door saloon. Uh, I know you want more time in that car, but we really do need to get this shot today. Tomorrow. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers oh, were added. Geez. The engine block was reinforced, <laughs> and new crankshafts were formed. Oh, my God. How do you, um... That was by terrible. Opel and machined in Germany. It's lost it over the bro. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tires were widened, and the tire compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. Oh, look away, The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the oh, Lotus Hull, designated Type 104 by Lotus. A Close. 177 miles per hour. If I could just get the grip down on that last part, I'd be in the chance. Saloon. We'll reset and take that section again. Why do I have it on the hardest end? I don't know. Lotus never quite let go of the upgrade game. So in addition to building their own supercars, they upgraded cars from other marks too. The Lotus Carlton was one such aftermarket upgrade. Lotus took a respectable four-door Vauxhall saloon and turned it into a supercar. From the outside, there are a few signs that this is something special. Wider wheel arches, that sort of thing. But under the bonnet, that's where the magic starts. Engine capacity was increased to 3.6 litres, and twin Garrett T25 turbochargers were added. The engine block was reinforced, and new crankshafts were forged by Opel and machined in Germany. At the roundabout, take the third exit. The tyres were widened, and the tyre compound from the Lotus Esprit was used. To handle camber change issues, they put in the self-leveling suspension from the Opel Senator. Turn. The only upgrade they didn't put in was an electronic speed limiter. All of this resulted in the Lotus Carlton. Designated Type 104 by Lotus. A 177 oh, 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 oh. miles per hour supercar. 
masquerading <laughs> as a four-door oh, I think I squeezed it in, Jesus. Only 950 of attempt. these custom gems were built, and they've become something of a modern classic. Not after I finish with it. <sighs> Oh my the God. Lotus Carlton Sunbeam. was an example of how to turn a saloon into a supercar. But that's not the only thing Lotus got up to. In 1979, Chrysler approached Lotus to create a strict rally version of their Sunbeam three-door hatchback. Lotus, as you might imagine, rather enjoyed the challenge. They took the rear-wheel drive hatchback and changed everything that matters. They stiffened the suspension, improved the anti-roll bars, and widened the transmission tunnel. Performance was increased by fitting a 2.2-litre version of the Lotus 911 slant four-cylinder engine resulting in an impressive 250 brake horsepower, up from a meagre 105 on the original. Ugh. Too much. One minute it feels like it wants to turn in, next minute it just bogs down. Lotus Sunbeam was revealed to the public in 1979 in Geneva to widespread praise in the motoring media. the Lotus Sunbeam saw racing success too. In 1980, Henri Toivonen won the 29th Lombard RAC Rally in his Sunbeam. wonder if Lotus should do more conversion. It's a silly question, actually. Lotus should do more conversions. In fact, I'll call them right now. Shop. wonder how many I've done. Oh, come on. Hiccups. Oh, give me something decent. I'll take the money. Put on a crappy emote. I honestly think these might be some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And the story of how it came about is, well, really British. Get in the car and let's get this segment. Jaguar is a bit of a favorite of mine. The company is almost a hundred years old and was originally founded to build sidecars for motorcycles. But this is the car that really set the bar, I think. The 1961 E-Type. When he saw it, Enzo Ferrari... Everybody raves about this car, but... ...the most beautiful car in the world. That would be a great film. High about. praise, indeed. He wasn't alone in his admiration. Accolades have followed this car ever since. 
It's been in movies, comics, games, and TV shows. Unlike some later cars in the Mark, it wasn't just looks, though. The E-Type was light and fast. It would do 153 miles an hour and stopped on innovative four-wheel brakes that were better than anything Ferrari or Porsche or even Mercedes-Benz had. It was solid, too, with a design based on the D-Type that won the 24 Hours of Le Mans three years in a row. At the roundabout, take the second exit. Anyone who owns an E-Type will tell you that the key to their reliability is to drive them regularly, as if you'd need the excuse. About two and a half thousand were built, and they're a common sight at auto shows, and surprisingly reasonably priced. All in all, an almost perfect Jaguar. The E-Type was the successor to the Le Mans winning D-Type. But what would that look like if Jaguar designed it today? In 2013, Jaguar answered that question with the F-Type Project 7, a spiritual successor to the E-Type and designed from the ground up to be the purest, most enjoyable Jaguar yet. The car's heritage is proudly displayed in the gorgeous D-type curves and the distinctive aero hunch behind the driving position. But like the E-type, it's not just Ow. a pretty face. That's not the best sounding car. V8 supercharged engine. With a fully aluminium body, it's blisteringly fast. With a 0 to 60 speed of 3.8 seconds and a top speed of 186 miles an hour. A car as beautiful as this must surely have been a carefully authored design. Actually, it started as a sketch by designer Cesar Pieri, thrown together one Friday in his free time. Jaguar's design director, Ian Callum, saw the sketch in a thumbnail on Cesar's computer during a meeting and asked him what it was. The rest is history. <laughs> 250 Project 7s were built as both a successor to the E-Type and as a celebration of Jaguar's victories at Le Mans. of us when I say thank heavens for Cesar's Friday afternoon doodle. <sighs> Friday doodle. Finish 40 different stories. Okay. How many stories are in this one? We're almost done, but we saved the good stuff for last. A spot of rallying in the most British car of them all. Get in, strap Amazing. in, and let's nail this Great. one.
There is one car built in Great Britain that is quite fairly uh, considered the one of the most this one? influential cars of the century. Oh. In 100 yards, turn left. It's a surprisingly spacious little city car with a side-mounted engine. It's an icon of popular culture. It's been built on every continent where there's a car factory. It's the Mini. The Mini Cooper S was built to be a performance machine with deeper engines, twin carburetors, and front disc brakes. This scrappy little machine would go on Getting to achieve would more than would 30 race victories thing. in the 1960s and 1970s. A Mini Cooper S flying number 37 placed first at the 1964 Monte Carlo Rally. Driven by Paddy Hopkirk and Henry Lydon, this was not the that last way. time an all-British crew would win the event. But not the last time a Mini would. At Monte Carlo in 1966, Minis took the first, second and third positions. They were all disqualified because they had dimming headlamps. Not because they were winning everything in sight. In 1999, the Car of the Century Award was presented to the most influential car of the 20th century. The Mini came second. It was beaten by the Model T Ford. That's fair, I suppose. Five point three million minis okay, were sold, them. making it the mini. most popular British car. Is the fast supposed to be a basic mini? I think not. And then in two thousand, BMW resumed production of the mini, breathing new life into the iconic mark. No. If the mini of the nineteen sixties had its sights set on the roads of Monte Carlo. The X-Raid Countryman has its eyes on something a little tougher. Monster. The deserts and rough terrain of the Dakar for starters. A wit once said that the only thing mini in this monster was the pedal. That's rather missing the point, I think. The X-Raid Countryman is much, Whoop. much bigger than the Mini Cooper. It has to be. A stage of the Dakar demands literally tons of gear. You could call it a tank. It does rather sound like one. There are any tanks that sound like this. Come on. When Mini's X-Raid division set out to build this thing, they had one goal in mind winning the Dakar. And they did, every year, from 2012 to 2015. In 400 yards, turn right. It's designed to be driven for two weeks over deserts and badlands, five kilometers above sea level. And it still handles like a hot hatch on a nice bit of dry air. Soil. Owners come and go. The heritage of a car like the Mini is more than who owns the keys to the shop. I fully expect to see Mini's wings flying for another century. Uh, that's not a bad car, I suppose. Better than some of the other off-road ones they have. Come to the end yet? Well, this is quite the story. Bentley at Le Mans in the 1930s. Gentlemen races and heroic driving. A personal hero of mine. Take good care of the cars, though. Both of them belong to me. <laughs> Where's the nearest wall? Bentley. 
a company founded in 1919 in Cricklewood, North London, and purchased by Rolls-Royce in the 30s. A company synonymous with both racing and luxury. Perhaps the best example I know of those two extremes of British engineering. For almost a century, every Bentley was hand-built to exacting standards. Oh so at the beginning of the 21st Hello. century, when Bentley revealed <laughs> their tractor. first mass-produced car, there were a great many questions. Right, I need to slow down You're a little right. bit by there, Not I guess. Worry. Reset and let's try another take. Bentley, a company founded in 1919 in Cricklewood, North London, and purchased by Rolls-Royce in the 30s. A company synonymous with both racing and luxury. Perhaps the best example I know of those two extremes of British engineering. For almost a century, every Bentley was hand-built to exacting standards. So at the beginning of the 21st century, Man, this thing when grip. Bentley revealed their first mass-produced car, there were a great many questions. Mm, the Lucas Carlton was better around that corner than this thing. production has done nothing to blunt the Bentley experience. The 2017 Continental Supersport is responsive, fast, and beautifully designed. together all-wheel drive, carbon fibre bonnet sides and side skirts to create the most powerful performance focused car the company has ever built. But never forget, Bentley's pedigree is racing and the Bentley Continental embraces that. In 2007, a largely standard Continental Speed GT broke Bugatti's record for the flying kilometer on the frozen Baltic Sea. No. And then in 2011, they broke their own record. 205 miles an hour, both ways, on ice. Even when building these gorgeous grand tours, Bentley is driven to excellence. Today, Bentley means modern, peerless luxury and elegance. But that's far from the full story. Oh, really? We're gonna A get century that. ago, Bentley me meant something else entirely. It meant Le Mans. In 1930, eccentric race team owner Dorothy Paget financed a rather special Bentley at the Le Mans. It was a 4.5-litre supercharged masterpiece. Driven by Sir Henry Bentley Boy Birkin, it posted the fastest time on the day, but it failed to finish. But what a race it was! Sir Henry's courageous driving forced Rudolf Caracciola's seven-litre Mercedes out of the race at the cost of his own victory. But in doing so, he ensured that the Bentley Sixes would take the victory. Sir Henry knew he didn't have anything to prove. In 1929, the adventurer Mrs. Mary Victor Bruce had already driven the resolutely modern 4.5-litre Bentley at Montlhaï, setting distance, speed, and endurance records. I want to go on the water, that's going to slow the way too much. The Bentley's performance so annoyed Ettore Bugatti 
that he called it the world's fastest lorry. Oh, and when the blower finally went on auction in 2012, it fetched more than enough to get yourself a Veyron and a racing truck. Love. The same then, please. Like I told them, can't make a film about car culture around here without you in it, can they? I'll let you know if they need you back. Thank God for that. yards. Turn left. That was nice. Turn left. Oh. yards turn left turn left in 400 yards turn right turn right you have arrived at your destination Kingfisher Cottage. Doesn't get any more serene than this, my friend. This one is on the National Heritage Register, though, so don't ask me to put in a satellite dish or a basketball court or anything. Enjoy. But like I said, take care. You do not want the National Heritage people after you. safe to do so. In 100 yards, turn right.
Too hot. yards turn right turn right in 400 yards turn left Turn left. In 200 yards, turn left. Turn left. Ah, oh, lost it. You have arrived at your destination. I'm gonna spend a little money. Here we are. Nice little semi detached cottage in Ambleside. It's neat, cozy, convenient for the festival site, and very, very British. Perfect for Horizon UK. What do you think? Excellent. I'll go sort the paperwork. This house has been on the market for ages. Great to see it in safe hands now. What else have we got? That one. What's this one? Corner. Yeah, we'll be buying that one anytime soon. All that one. Well, that one. There's a live event. Do the drift, but yeah, 
It's not exactly my thing. <coughs> Jeez, excuse me. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's go up and do drift. I'll have a little try for a bit. It's getting late for me anyway, so we'll have a little go. Turn around when it is safe to do so. In 200 yards, turn right. Turn right. yards. Turn left. Turn left. yards turn right turn right Hundred yards, turn left. Turn left. In four hundred yards, turn left. arrived at your destination. And this is where it's going to go really bad. Good news. Drift Club membership is climbing steadily thanks to you. As soon as I get the membership thanks cards and name badges ready, you'll be the first to know. I'd like us to be known as an inclusive club. You don't need a Japanese performance machine to throw around. An American performance machine will do very nicely too. This route is quite lengthy, so you'll need a good bit of forward as well as sideways. In 400 yards, turn sharp right. <clears throat> turn sharp right. Got a bit of grunt. Force equals mass times acceleration minus friction. Drifting is all mathematics, you see. I do like mathematics. Though, you might say it's as easy as braking on the way into the turn to make the back lively. This shifts weight onto the front of the car, increasing grip, and reducing weight on the rear wheels. Uh -oh. Okay, that's not gonna work, is it? Actually, 
use the pad in a second. set up, but Turn this feels left. like it's fighting me. I need to change my wheel settings, but I'm just not sure which way to change them. Turn left. I have some more yet. I really need to prep the strip thing. Let's tab out a second. Not like that. Let's try. Boop, 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 boop. Let's try a different wheel setup. Oh, what you can do is practice. This route is quite lengthy, so you'll need a good bit of forward as well as sideways. <laughs> In 400 yards, turn sharp right. Turn sharp right. Equals mass times acceleration minus friction. Drifting is all mathematics. You see, I do like mathematics. Though, you like might say it's as easy as braking on the way into the turn to make the back lively. This shifts weight onto the front of the car, increasing grip, and reducing weight on the rear wheels. See, this just feels too light now. Enjoying that setup at all, but hold on, let's swap. If we look at 30 dampening, uh, what if we put that on? Let's 
Let's see if that helps. Probably won't, but a bit more feet on that now. Turn sharp left. Oh. Even the slight increase makes a hell of a difference to the feel of the wheel, but I feel it pulling and correcting itself. 200 yards. Turn left. Turn left. In 200 yards, turn sharp right. Turn sharp right. This route is quite lengthy, so you'll need a good bit of forward as well as sideways. In 400 yards, turn sharp right. Turn sharp right. <laughs> Shouldn't have hit the grass, really. Times acceleration minus friction. Drifting is all mathematics, you see. I do like mathematics. Though, you might say it's as easy as braking on the way into the turn to make the back lively. This shifts weight onto the front of the car, increasing grip, and reducing weight on the rear wheels. Yards. 
just fighting against me. Granted, that's fine, but I think it's too much. Turn left. One save. Well, whatever has been typed in chat, say, hey. So you'll need a good bit of forward as well as sideways. Gonna need a good bit of luck. Acceleration minus friction. Drifting is all mathematics, you see. I do like mathematics. Though, you might say it's as easy as braking on the way into the turn to make the back lively. This shifts weight onto the front of the car, increasing grip, and reducing weight on the rear wheels. Nice and smooth drifting. I don't know how they do it. Greta hats off to them, that's for sure. In 200 yards, have to just unreal sharp. driving altogether. Like. Turn sharp right. Father's brother. This is just 
on my thing. Let's see what they give me next to fail in. There's a nice spot on the way up to Edinburgh the Drift Club's been eyeing up. I think you've earned the right to have first crack and show off a little, what you reckon? I've uh, thrown no. on new high grip <laughs> front tyres, tuned the throttle response to the computer fail. and loaded it on firm springs. Well, if you get a show off, and so do I. I've put in a route down to the old rail yard. I think you'll see what I'm getting at. Skittish. And up here, just a cheeky little detour down the side. Having rather a lot of fun, though. No. That was like. That was good driving by the AI. Brilliant. I put in a route down to the old rail yard. I think you'll see what I'm getting. Drift really does feel like you're just never gonna get it. Go back to the first one. Hello, my name is Robert. Don't need to tell me your name, Joel's done Hello. plenty of that. <laughs> uh, I've gathered a group of like-minded drivers together here at the festival, and I hoped you might help us attract more. 
We're called Drift Club, you see. We like to... Well, <laughs> you can probably guess. Some like the rush, but I'm rather partial to the engineering, I must say. Why don't you take my old Nissan 240 out and see which you enjoy better? The first thing to do, really, is go into your car settings and switch off the traction control. It might be a button, or it might need a pair of pliers and a pair of tape, but it must be done. Traction is the natural enemy of drifting. Settings, maybe it's because I've got stability control on it. Good night. So in a wall, it's going to be ridiculous. Hello, my name is Robert. Oh, Don't need to tell me your name, Joel's done plenty of that. Uh, I've gathered a group of like-minded drivers together here at the festival, and I hoped you might help us attract more. We're called Drift Club, you see. We like to... Well, <laughs> you can probably guess. Some like the rush, but I'm rather partial to the engineering, I must say. Why don't you take my old Nissan 240 out and see which you enjoy better? Thanks, but The first thing to do, really, is go into your car settings and switch off the traction control. It might be a button, or it might need a pair of pliers and a pair of tape, but it must be done. Traction is the natural enemy well, of drifting. I think I need to back off the power a little bit. Get off the grass with that. A bit of speed, turn in, feather the e-brake as you hold the accelerator. It's more of an art form, really, and uh -huh. then you work it out. So it is impressive when you get it right, but boy, when you end up learning, you just feel like such a plum. I think what we need to do is get a, a drifty type of car and go for a practice, because this isn't working very well, is it? because I have a new idea. Nope. This one says go around on me. 
I don't know where it's gonna stop. Ah, oh, bad luck. You did seem to be having rather a lot of fun, though. That's off to the guys who do it in this game. I have no idea. Let's do 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 change car. I do have a drift car, not that I've ever driven it really. Turn around when it is safe to do so. Three. Found it. In 100 yards, turn left. Turn right. Either because I don't have a clue, or I've got it set up completely wrong, which is making it be how it should be. I should put more dampening in. In 400 yards, turn right. This doesn't feel right. Turn right. In 200 yards, turn right. Turn right. In 200 yards, turn left.
looks like there's a lot more less, well, a lot less power, I should say. to look at the map again. I don't know where I'm going. We want to go over here. And we're down there. In that general direction, I think. So I've gone in the wrong, wrong direction, I think. Save. Turn right. Route. In 200 yards, 
Turn left. No one did. Turn around when it is safe to do so. Calculating route. In 100 yards, turn sharp left. Uh, well. Can't even get out. <laughs> on the outside of the mm. oh, I don't know. Right, I better end it there anyway, it's getting late. And we'll have some practice some other time and learn at a drift, which is probably going to take me years. Anyway, I'll be back another time. Thank you for sticking around, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.